Hey guys and welcome back to another YouTube video. In this video I'll be going through the Adelaide vs Port Adelaide uh, derby game in which um, Port played so bad. <laughs> it was so funny to watch and it was just behind after behind after behind. What did Port have another like six shots or whatever? Um, 23 shots to 18 and they still ended up losing by 30. Which just sort of shows that you're never going to win with five goals, 18, ever in a game. Or very, very rarely, you'd have to have a really wet, short game in like COVID or something, that COVID season, to probably win with five goals, 18. Um, as, yeah, just any team that kicks eight goals or seven goals is probably going to beat that. And uh, Adelaide kicked 12, and it was um, really low scoring after quarter time, I'm pretty sure. After quarter time, I don't, I think there was only like another... Or I want to say um, maybe another five goals kicked or something for the whole game. Something like that. Let me just check here. Um, there was seven plus two. There was nine goals kicked in the remaining three quarters after seven in the first, after eight in the first. So there was almost half the goals kicked in the first quarter. And then it was just so low scoring. It was 30 to 22 at quarter time. And you're like, okay, this game's probably going to be on for maybe 200 or so points, 100 each, or somewhere around that marker port looked all right at that point. There were three goals, four, and then they kicked two goals, 14 from that point onwards, which just sort of shows the port were well out of it. But anyway, before we get into this video, remember to like and subscribe, turn the notification bell on so you know when I upload, and let's get into the video. So, the um, showdown medalist went to Saligo, and rightfully so. If we look at the stats here, I'm going to be flicking in between if it doesn't pop up ads, and you can see Saligo, 28, one mark, 10 tackles. Huge effort from him, and rightfully the showdown medal. He was absolutely huge on the day and ended up with a 146 super coach, I believe. Um, let me just make this super co this one a little bit bigger so that it's actually seeable. There we go, and get rid of that ad because we don't need an ad. There we go. Um, Matty Crouch, uh, 103, and the thing about Saligo, and I'm going to say this, and people are probably going to take the piss out of me for saying this, I'm not going to be selecting or even considering Saligo in uh, trade targets this week, because you want to go for those guys that are top of the line guys, and Saligo, if you actually look at his stats, I believe he's only averaging 103 in the last three weeks, even though it's been an amazing last three weeks. He's only averaging 103, and even guys like Butters, who's had a horrific last three weeks, I believe, is still averaging 106 in the last three. Whereas um, if we go to last round, you'll see Saligo is at a 103. So yeah, just shows the difference between them. And um, yeah, that's why I would be going and not really looking at Saligo. Um, and I'd be looking at um, the likes of... Uh, um, other top 8 to 12 guys in the midfield, whether this is Supercoach or Fancy. Crouch at 103, and really, again, we saw yet again, he really does take away from the likes of Dawson. And you'll see here, when he had a 59 half, um, Dawson had a uh, 37 half. And when Dawson had a 63 half, Crouch had a 44 half. They sort of go hand in hand of being sort of almost, what well, it's mutually exclusive for scoring well. I mean, Dawson still did school score 100, but it was a really lucky 100 in the fact that he went and went off in the second half here. Uh, five marks, five tackles. He had, I think, four marks and three tackles in the second half alone, which is almost what a lot of players would want in a full game. And he did that as well as having a really good, and obviously we know that this is the way he plays, but he obviously has a really good kick to handball ratio. But wow, he was really bad with the four um, four clangers. Uh, Rory Laird 100 as well, um, but the four clangers didn't really get as much um, clearance work out of them. The, the clearance work in general from the, the midfield here was pretty good, but it wasn't outstanding. Um, but yeah, uh, this, this group here, um, I just think that they all take points off each other and it's almost like they're going to be sort of a, I think a 300 sort of club in general, all three of them. Like, they will get this, but they won't. It depends. Is it going to be a Dawson 140 and a Laird 90, and then a, what would that be, a 70 for a Crouch? Or is it going to be a Dawson 120, a Laird 100, and an 80 for Crouch? I think it will be something along those lines each and every week. And that's why I'm not going to be grabbing Dawson or Saligo. Uh, well, Saligo is exclusive to that argument, but... um. I don't think Dawson right now with his role, and I'd like to just double check this. Um, if we go to DFS, I don't know if they'll have the stats up here yet for the 
Dawson, um, but you can see here Dawson only 60% this game. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something similar. Um, let me actually check. I think I can check this for you. Uh, let's go here. No, not that one. Um, Centre bounce attendances. Let me just check. Um, Dawson was at 10 centre bounce attendances out of a possible, what was it, 17, 21. So he was at, I think, 45% of centre bounces. Roll depleted. It was more like this. Let me actually check this now because that might be awfully similar. Um, and we go to Adelaide. Um, so you had Riley O'Brien, I believe, at roughly 88%. Uh, that's from 33. Um, then you had Jordan Dawson. So Saligo at 17. Um, 17 out of 21. That's probably about, what, 80% or so, give or take. Crouch at 15 of 21. I believe it's 21. Uh, 15 of 21, which is roughly around that 70% range, um, which links up nicely here. I think, it, yeah, I think it's roughly around that 71, 72%. So, yeah, um, it just shows that that role is really volatile. What was uh, Rory Laird was at 70% as well. So it looked like it was 80, 70, 70, and then the rest sort of went to Dawson, and then you had uh, Rochelle got one. So, yeah, I'm just not too keen on Dawson. That role is fluctuating way too much for my liking. Hinge, 93. Fogarty, 92. Fogarty went off early, but he's a key forward, so you never go for him. Worrell, Scholl, Riley O'Brien, uh, McElhaney, um, Rochelle as well. Just the role is really volatile. Nank Curvis, I thought it was definitely better, Rochelle, in this game. Nank, um, Nank Curvis, Rankin, Keys. Uh, this is why you don't go for Rankin, given that the role, um, the role just isn't there for him. Uh, I don't know why they didn't run him in the midfield, but I mean, that they've found Saligo in that midfield, so maybe... And I don't know why they do this, because uh, Saligo going in there doesn't really fix the problem. You need one of these two to come out of there in Crouch or Laird or lower their time, because Saligo is just replacing Dawson, and that's not that much of a difference maker. Um, Rankin, Keys, Keane, uh, Walker, Himmelberg, McHenry, Butts, Jones, Curtin, I thought looked really good, or, or decent, I should say, early. Um, especially in that second quarter, but um, definitely one to develop and grow. And um, his role isn't fancy and inclusive and uh, or inducive, I should say. And um, he's probably gonna. I, I I think they'll give him a good run, like five or six games. But I'm just worried that he kind of wrecks his average or something like that, puts it like a fifty, and then we never see him again in fancy for like the next three or four years until he gets that midfield switch that I think he will get when he's like 22, but I don't think we'll see it anytime soon, and I think he'll be more of a, um, a key back, and then hopefully as time develops, he's either going to go to a halfback or the midfield switch that we saw in the under-18s, was it National Champs, where he played a game as a midfielder and did really well. So yeah, I, I, I just think that he'll be played more of a key um, than what the type of... Because I think he could easily be like a Nick Blakey type player. Um, as that sort of fourth tall, um, third or fourth tall, but I think they're playing him a little bit too tall at the moment, or maybe he was just isolated too much to really take too much of a note of that. Um, Cook and then Smith, and he did get subbed out, which kind of sucks, but it wasn't really noteworthy. Then we go with Shuport and Ollie Mines as well. The, the hit out King himself had, I think, another three hit outs this game. It's really funny to look at the stat line and then see Ollie Wines with like hit outs, and you look here, what was it, three hit outs here, 10 tackles. He's doing really well. Um, for but obviously not really relevant. Um, I know that these guys, some players still have them. If we look at uh, fancy and we go to wines, he's still going to be like six or seven percent owned. I reckon, yeah, it's five percent owned. But he's not owned in the top uh, echelon of sort of like that top ranking of top ten k really that highly. Um, I can do the same sort of analysis with the uh, super coach and show you that the rank one percent wouldn't have uh, wines too highly. I, even I'll, I'll do it on my phone here uh, while we're talking. But um. 116 super coach did really well, but these guys they've been jumped off of a lot of us jumped off of them very very quickly in the first sort of three to four weeks when Ollie Wines had that hamstring, as well as the fact that he didn't score too too well, um, so we jumped off very very quickly just because um, they're not really going to be relevant, and you would rather either a cash gen or a um, or the Martins or the like Hen Young etc etc those guys that are actually getting games in the right roles and have the ability to pop. Um, obviously, he has popped here, but um, just these guys are going to be a lot more noteworthy. Um, let me actually just check. I'm quickly getting him up in the top 1%. Uh, 
Top 1% he is owned by 11 people in the top 1% in Supercoach. Uh, yeah, 0.6% ownership because that top 1% is roughly around 1,700 teams, I believe. So yeah, not much ownership there. And then in the top 5%, he is owned by 1.5% of teams. So you can see some teams have held him, but I don't think there'll be much... I don't think people are going to be jumping onto him because I think a lot of a lot of players are just going to be able to outdo him. Um, but as I thought was really really good, uh, took I would say seven or eight bounces across the whole game, um, and that really does help his super coach score. And a lot of clearances um, and contested possession did help his scoring. But it would have been nice to have seen a little bit more tackling and marking early on, as I believe that marking and tackling all came basically exclusively in the last quarter, except for I think one tackle with about two or three minutes going third. Um, Bergman did all right as well. He's been really good as a wingman, but as we say with wingmen, we don't touch them unless they have an inside role, and Bergman doesn't, so he is bound to have that down game. Remember, we had, had the same exact conversation with, um, who was it? Who was it? Um, was it Bergman himself, maybe, that had that same conversation with? But there was another wingman that was doing all right as well. And, yeah, sometimes they just have down games where it's like a 30 or a 40. Oh, it was Xavier Dersma, yes. Xavier Dersma had that down game after that really good start. And if we go here as well, you see exactly what I mean. Um, and you see here, he was doing so well. Some people thought, oh, yeah, let's grab Mim and then a 53 and a 73. And that's why you pick up top of the line guys rather than these guys here. Um, Jordan Sweet, 88 and 74, did all right. Um, would have liked to have seen him... Um, not have as many clangers, that probably would have helped. But against one of the toughest rucks in um, O'Brien, he probably, he did all right. Um, O'Brien dominated the hitouts, um, and he definitely had a couple of clearances sharp, uh, which didn't help his super coach score. So next week, who do they play? Port Adelaide. Um, next week, they play the likes of Geelong against a Geelong ruck that could easily be Conway. Um, I'm expecting Jordan Sweet to do really well. So, yeah, I'm happy to have him still um, on both the R3s. And then I'm probably going to take the score on both just because, effectively, it is Sam uh, Sam Darcy that I'm going to be taking the taking off the field to get him as that was the easiest way to just sort of... I'm just a little bit worried that Sam Darcy could drop a 40 just because he's key position. Um, Dixon Boak, Jones... Houston, Rioli, Drew, Farrell, Burton, Horn Francis as well. Um, the comments from BT, that was really weird. But um, he didn't really impact the game at all. Burgoyne, and then we go to Connor Rosie. And I think enough is said. I suspect they're going to give him a rest. Given that they basically said what we found when he subbed out uh, this week was the exact same as what happened last week. And so it's like he's going to be in the same position this week as well. And they're just going to, I think it's just best for... Um, for Connor Rosie that he actually doesn't play. And I think that that's what's going to happen. So I would be moving him on as um, his break-even is stuffed and he's losing a lot of cash. Like I think he's going to lose like 120, 130K in the next couple of weeks. And Supercoach, I remember from uh, Scooby's uh, uh, predictions, I believe. Um, I Don't quote me on that though. Or Bryce's predictions, I believe he's losing a lot of cash. But um yeah, so 51 from him and subbed out. He just didn't look right. And you could tell when he when he hobbled from that um from that uh when he sort of stamped down on it that um that hamstring had something wrong with it. So yeah, I'd just be moving him on to someone um that's a top eight or a top twelve type of guy. Um the new Burn Jones, Georgiades, Williams, Zerk Thatcher, Radigalia, Todd Marshall, McEntee, and the Meade came on. Meads just He's going to have, like, one of the best uh, <laughs> uh, prices, I guess, next year, me. Let's look at him. A 48 average for a guy that when he actually plays is averaging, like, 60. That's all right. I mean, it could be better. But he's had, what, three sub games now. Oh, if he didn't have this 53 here and he had, like, a 15, he'd be so much better. He'd be a 43 and actually be some uh, big price up, uh, a discount factor. But anyway... That's just me looking at uh, really, really underpriced guys, but he's going to have no relevance next year anyway. But anyway, that is the video there, I guess, and I will see you guys in the next recap tomorrow of the next derby game between Collingwood and Carlton that happens tonight, and um, we'll see who really does well. I'm expecting, um, 
the Carlton midfield to dominate, to be honest, with the clearances, um, just because the Collingwood, um, both, I, I, I do think that Pitnet is the better tap ruckman, and I do think that the Carlton midfield is also a lot better than the Collingwood midfield that they're going to turn out, even though Collingwood's going to have Pendlebury, Dacos, and Chris probably as the main parts in there, but they're going to have to run O'Sullivan through there as well, and pre- probably potentially even like a Joss Dacos or something like that as well. Uh, which just is a little bit off. But anyway, that is the video there, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys.